You're a podcast listener, and this is a podcast ad. Reach great listeners like yourself with podcast advertising from Lips and Ads. Choose from hundreds of top podcasts offering host endorsements, or run a reproduced ad like this one across thousands of shows to reach your target audience with Lips and Ads. Go to lipsandads.com now. That's L I B S Y N ads.com. History as it happens, June 11th, 2024. Trumpism after the conviction. A verdict has been reached in former President Donald Trump's New York criminal trial. Count one, guilty. Count two, guilty. While this defendant may be unlike any other in American history, we arrived at this trial and ultimately today at this verdict in the same manner as every other case that comes through the courtroom doors. They see this happening and they're so desperate to stop them that they are willing to use the judicial system to do so. It is a new low and it's a dangerous one. We're going to knock off the Biden crime family as a Biden family of crime, including the fact that they've weaponized the Department of Justice like has never happened in this country. We're going to end the weak and failed regime of crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of our country, and we can make America great again. Never before has a former president been convicted of a crime, but rarely has it been so difficult to understand how something like this might influence our politics. Although it is certain Trump will be the GOP nominee, even if by some chance he's sentenced to prison. The former president is wearing his conviction as a badge of honor, now part of the light motif of his campaign and the story of his political identity. That's next as we report history as it happens. A podcast from the Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. It's a pro-drug dealer bill. It's weak. It's ineffective. It's bullshit what he signed. One of the things about a political leader is that it's hard to put an ism on them until they're gone from the scene. You know, you look at the Reagan legacy and the Nixon legacy in the Republican Party, and you'll see that there's a much clearer and more enduring Reagan legacy after his presidency than after Nixon's. So I think with Trump, so much of it is Trump's own personality. And we've seen certainly that Trump is able to win elections. You remember the 1988 presidential campaign? Colorado Senator Gary Hart was running for the Democratic nomination. But he was photographed with a woman who was not his wife, named Donna Rice. They had taken a trip together on a luxury yacht named, I kid you not, Monkey Business. And that was it for Gary Hart's political career. Seems like a thousand centuries ago. Well, future historians will one day write about 2024, how the Republican nominee four years earlier egged on a mob to attack Congress, the futile culmination of a month-long scheme to steal the election. And it did not end his career. And rather than apologizing, he would refer to the rioters as warriors and hostages. But those J6 warriors, they were warriors, but they were really more than anything else. They're victims of what happened. All they were doing is protesting a rigged election. That's what they were doing. And then the police say, go in, go in, go in. Go in. How about Scaffold Joe, the guy on the scaffold? Or how about the big FBI guy or whatever, wherever he comes from? Go on in, everybody. Go on in. What a setup that was. What a horrible, horrible thing. It was a setup, said Donald J. Trump, speaking in Las Vegas. Another stream of consciousness stump speech where he warned of an invasion by illegal aliens, called President Biden a criminal for failing to secure the border, and riffed about his enemies, including the special counsel Jack Smith, who is prosecuting Trump for his role in the January 6 mayhem, and in a classified documents case. I said, I don't want to be, I don't want to get off like that. I did nothing wrong. It's Presidential Records Act. I did nothing. You know, we have a deranged individual named Jack Smith. He's a deranged, a dumb guy. He's a dumb son of a bitch. Well, as we know, Donald Trump does like to call people names, and Democrats are calling him a name, convicted felon. Although that title, if you want to call it that, does not seem to matter much to his supporters. If anything, they are even more committed now than they were before Alvin Bragg brought his case to court. And this brings us to a question we have visited and revisited on the podcast. What is Trumpism? Does our history serve as any guide for what's happening today? Some people do spend a lot of time rummaging around the 1930s Europe looking for analogies. 
I prefer to look at our own recent past, the post-Cold War populist tilt in the Republican Party personified by Pat Buchanan. So today we call for a new patriotism where Americans begin to put the needs of Americans first. Still, even though I try to avoid the word unprecedented, Donald Trump is unique. Trumpism is not a political ideology. You can say it's a kind of populism or phony populism in my view, but it is not a coherent set of ideas. Pat Buchanan talked a lot about policy. He had an ideology. Whatever list of policy plans might be attached to Trumpism, like deporting immigrants, isn't really what's important here. Trumpism is Trump, his grievances, his sense of victimhood, which he shares with his supporters. They indict guys like Trump for, not, for what? Uh, the election was rigged. The election was a rigged election. Oh, let's indict him for saying that. Whereas you got guys like this, you got guys that kill people, and they're fine. They're just fine. Well, a big part of Trumpism is the entire system is rigged. Politics, the courts, everything. Everything that doesn't go his way is the result of a nefarious conspiracy to hurt him and, by extension, the people. Well, maybe you disagree with how I'm defining Trumpism. You can let me know your definition via email, M-D-I-C-A-R-O, that's mdicaro at washingtontimes.com. And maybe I'll share your email in my weekly newsletter. You can sign up for that at historyasithappens.com or, or search for History As It Happens on Substack. Donald Trump is a Republican, but is he conservative? Our guest today says no. Dan McLaughlin is a senior writer at the conservative flagship, The National Review. He is also a lawyer who's been following the legal cases against Trump. Dan McLaughlin, welcome back. Glad to be here. So over the years, I've done a number of episodes about Trumpism at different milestones or what I thought would be important milestones, uh, like the 2022 midterm elections where the Republicans underperformed. We're going to do that now after the conviction. And uh, as a friend of mine likes to remind me, only fools try to predict the future. So I'm not going to make any bold predictions here. But if you force me to make a guess, take a guess about this, I would say the conviction probably won't have much of an impact on the election. I, I will say the only thing cloudier than trying to predict the future is trying to assess the state of mind of Donald J. Trump. So, you know, we're in uncharted territory, so it's impossible to predict. We can put a pin in the fact that Trump was leading in pretty much across the board, not decisively, but across the board in the polls prior to this. So I think as you get a few weeks or a month out, you can see whether you're registering movement in the polls. And that'll tell us a lot, although there remains the question of whether the polls are really going to tell us how this thing is going to turn out, because our assumption has been that one of my background assumptions has been that, you know, Biden lacks a certain amount of enthusiasm in his followers, but his base is it's sort of flipped from what the usual assumption was, you know, 10 years ago, that it's actually the Democrat base now has a lot more of the kinds of people who show up at every election. And Trump is depending more on larger voters. And so it is entirely possible that the polls are accurately telling us that Trump will win among an electorate that is not exactly who's going to show up on Election Day. And that, that was some of what happened in 2022, although midterm elections are more variable. But I mean, the one other thing I will, I will say is that, you know, none of this is going to affect how people feel about Biden. And so at the end of the day, it's possible that the voters are just done with Biden. You know, in the 1991 governor's race in Louisiana, Buddy Romer was running for reelection and he finished third to a convicted felon and a Klansman. So sometimes the voters are just done with. Him. Well, a couple things. Uh, Donald Trump's never been a very popular figure. And maybe we've simply hit bottom as far as how low his popularity or lack of popularity can fall. Uh, also, I mean, this felony conviction is not the worst thing he's done. Sicking a mob on another branch of government to try to overturn an election, period, end of story, disqualifying. But that wasn't enough to have Republicans drop him. But also this case itself. I mean, you've been, you're a lawyer, you've been critical of this case. The National Review is no defender of Trump. But legally speaking, I think a lot of people can look at this case and say, you know what, these were misdemeanors. This wasn't a felony case and election interference. I don't know about that. Yeah, I mean, certainly my view is that these are not misdemeanors. They're not crimes at all. Undoubtedly, the story told by the prosecutors is a story of Trump acting immorally. And I think they had a mountain of evidence to show that. 
and Trump's defense was stupid to contest a lot of that. But fundamentally, they did not make out a case of a violation of the law here. I mean, there were a whole bunch of legal defects in the case. But to me, the biggest one is simply the fact that under New York law, you need to show for, for even the misdemeanor intent to defraud someone with the false documents. And they just didn't show that. They didn't show that these were records that were ever designed to be seen or shown to anybody. And it fuels his narrative uh, that he's politically persecuted. I mean, the whole the whole system is rigged against him. Radical leftists from uh, Bragg all the way up to the White House uh, talking about the Manhattan district attorney. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that the certainly the electoral system is rigged. Uh, I don't think the justice system in general is. rigged. But I do think that investigations and prosecutions and even some of the civil cases that have been brought against Trump have bent and mutilated the rule of law in ways that are that are fairly shocking. And I think it makes it difficult for the Democrats to sell one of their key messages in this election, which is that they're still pushing is that Donald Trump wants to jail his political opponents. Well, it's kind of hard, you know, to say that Trump is going to like bend the law to jail his political opponents while you and your party are busy in four different jurisdictions bending the law to try to jail Donald Trump. Bend and mutilate, you said. All right, let's take the the January 6th case. I mean, that seems pretty sound to me as a non-lawyer. No, it's certainly not the headline charge, the conspiracy to defraud charge. You know, there's there's case law going all the way back to the teens and 20s of the last century. Unanimous Supreme Court cases basically saying, look, open defiance. The government is not fraud. You know, this statute doesn't even apply to elections. So it should be an open and shut case, at least on the main charge. My grievance here is that, as in the New York case, I think they're stretching the concept of the fraud well beyond the point where it makes any sense. There isn't anything in there that actually looks like – I mean, I spent two decades defending largely civil fraud cases, some in, in criminal law. And so I have a pretty good handle on what fraud is and isn't. And, and this is just – it's not fraud. You know, I mean, everything was done out in the open. It was insurrection or something close to it. I think there's definitely, uh, you know, a case for charging some people with insurrection. I don't think there's a case for charging Trump with it, though. The D.C. case attempts to do an end around because the Supreme Court's First Amendment test under Brandenburg v. Ohio basically says yeah. that if you're going to you know, charge someone with for speech, it has to be incitement of imminent lawless action. Rather than try to meet that test, what Jack Smith has done is said that Trump is effectively conspiring with the people who – did the imminent lawless action. If you accept that that end around, then Brandenburg's a dead letter, and the First Amendment means a lot less than it did before. There was a political remedy here. Congress could have, after impeaching him, then the Senate could have convicted him and passed a law forbidding him from ever holding office again. But They could have done that, and they should have done that. So what is Trumpism right now? Every election is about competing visions between the candidates for the future of the country, or it's supposed to be about the future. If you talk about the past, you're probably not going to win. What is Trumpism offering the country right now? Because, you know, he's taking this felony conviction and adding it to his pile of grievances, his stated desire for revenge. He just repeated it again that he's willing, although it's impossible to know for sure if he's going to stick to anything, you know, go after his political opponents if he wins by prosecuting them the way he says he's been prosecuted. You know, his unfounded claims that everything in American society is rigged against people like him. But I don't see a lot of positive vision or policy for the future of the country here. I mean, there is some, I mean, I wrote a column a while back about like 12 different flavors of Trumpism. One of the things about a political leader is that it's hard to put an ism on them until they're gone from the scene. You know, you look at the Reagan legacy and the Nixon legacy in the Republican Party, and you'll see that there's a much clearer and more enduring Reagan legacy after his presidency than after Nixon's. So I think with Trump, so much of it is Trump's own personality. And we've seen certainly that Trump is able to win elections, or at least he's won one. Uh, and he's, he's leading at the moment in this one. And many of the people who have tried to imitate him have not. You know, I mean, he is the most famous man to run for president since uh, Eisenhower. The sheer force of his personality, he is entertaining, he's good television. A lot of it is that. And, and, you know, I mean, the worst parts of Trumpism to me are the lies about the rigged system stuff, the lies about the sore loserism and everything, the attacks on the legitimacy of our system, but also the bending of the party around the personal interests of one man. Right. Yeah, well, uh, on trashed, the other hand, uh, he trashed the peaceful transfer of power. 
Yeah. And I mean, on the other hand, you know, I think you can see the outlines of some things that he represents, most of which preceded him. The parts of his agenda that are kind of Buchananite. Yeah, I agree. Perhaps you would say. And Buchanan being a guy who actually kind of represented a particular tendency that has outlived his own involvement in politics. But, you know, some of that stuff certainly has moved the party in a particular direction on immigration, on trade, on foreign policy. So I think there is some of that that you can represent as a positive policy vision. Now, seriously, friends, neither Beltway Party is going to drain this swamp because to them it isn't a swamp. It's a protected wetland. If I'm elected president, we are going to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. Well, there's still some Reaganism left in the Republican Party. Not too much, but there is. Or what some might call, uh, here's another word with an ism that people dispute, neoliberalism, deregulation of the financial services industry, the flow of capital around the world, low taxes. We don't need to get into debate of whether that's neoliberalism or what, but, you know, there's still some of that. Yeah, I, I would argue that I would argue that a good deal of that is classical liberalism that you could find directly in the uh, the platform of Abraham Lincoln. But. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Clinton falls into the age of Reagan insofar that his administration, especially his second term, pursued a lot of these policies. Trump did govern like a traditional Republican in, those, in that regard. I don't know. Now, I don't hear him talk a lot about policy. I hear him talk about immigration, and that's one thing he seems to have views that he will stick with. And also tariffs, which are not very Reaganite. I mean, he's not a free trader. But I don't know. I find that what he's offering is a pretty dark vision for the future of the country that is really all about him. So you're a conservative who does not support Trump. Where should conservatives who, not that you're here to give people advice, where should people go in November? The answer to that has always been vote your conscience. You know, I I have never denounced people who chose to vote for Trump in the general election because I thought they decided it was a lesser evil. I can't go there because I think that the character of the executive matters too much. I think it's much more defensible to vote for people of ill character when push comes to shove for a legislative position. You know, I mean, I defended like voting for Herschel Walker, for example. But why? the president has so many sweeping powers and so much discretion. Yeah, well, well, let me uh, ask you, though, why would you matters. vote? Why did you defend Herschel Walker? He seemed completely ignorant of government. Fundamentally, because the most important job of a legislator is is how he votes and how he, particularly in the modern caucus-based system, which party controls the chamber is enormously important. I mean, I didn't think Walker was a good candidate in any sense, but uh, you know, when push came to shove, I think it was it was entirely consistent for conservatives and even pro-lifers to cast a ballot for Walker. You know, I mean, similarly. I don't know if I could pull the lever for Carrie Lake in Arizona. I know I could not have voted for her governor of Arizona, but it's a different decision when you're talking about the Senate. Is Donald Trump an authoritarian? Uh, I think he certainly has the authoritarian personality. First of all, he has lived his whole life in America, and his public career, such as it is, has been constrained by the American system. And I think that does put some limits on what you might call the authoritarian imagination of what's possible and what's doable. But I certainly think he has the personality for it. You know, I think some of the talk about descent into fascism is kind of a misunderstanding of the historical parallels. Um, that was going to be my next know. question. Um, I've uh, I've dipped my toe into that debate many times, read books, reviewed books from my newspaper about it. Every time I go on Twitter or X, I see this endless debate about fascism. Donald Trump is not a fascist. Republicans are not fascists. There is no serious fascist movement in our country. I think you and I agree on that. But, I mean, this stuff is out there, and it certainly colors people's view of what's at stake in November. Uh, I don't know. My view of Trump is he does have authoritarian instincts, whether he can accomplish these things given institutional constraints and norms, whatever's left of our norms, or just by people who would be appointed in his administration who would refuse to go along with some of his more wrongheaded policies, as was the case the first time around, right? My concern is the chaos and the incompetence that would accompany another term. We all remember who was in charge in 2020. It was Donald Trump and his handling of the pandemic is evidence of what happens when you have somebody in office who doesn't know what they're doing and is not interested in the work in the particulars. 
I think that's why it's going to be so important to see what we really don't know at all, which is who's going to staff this administration if yeah. he gets elected, who he's going to pick, you know, who he's going to have choosing judges. I mean, we, we editorialized in favor of putting out another judges list. I think the judges list combined with the selection of Mike Pence as vice president were things that gave people a lot of reassurance that Trump would govern in a more competent and traditional Republican way last time around. And we have, have not seen that. We've seen a lot of indications the Trump world is more hostile to institutional Republican Party than it has been in the past. On the other hand, look, I mean, I am very worried about the effect that Trump has both on his supporters and on his enemies of wearing away at the norms that underlie our systems and institutions. And I think if you look around the world, it's a bad time. You know, who is the best world leader right now? Boy, you have a very short list of people who are any yeah. good at all. You look across Western Europe, you look across East Asia and Central Asia and Latin America and, and South Asia. And there's a lot of grim news and it's it's left populists, it's right populists, it's if you will, neoliberals who are totally inept and some of whom have sort of slid into their own kinds of domestic authoritarianism. One of the things that is a parallel, if a tenuous one, to the 1930s is that things took a bad turn everywhere at once, in a sense that, that there were global trends in how people were selecting their governments and how governments were behaving. And that, I think, should concern us, is that we are in an illiberal hour a time of fraying tolerance, fraying respect for authority and institutions. And There's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, and diversity and multiculturalism and, you know, the other foreignness. You know, though, that's most of human history, not to go off on that tangent. But I guess, though, if you're looking for somebody to vote for, then I'm kidding here. But Biden, he carried the Reaganite banner to Normandy on the D-Day anniversary, and he gave a speech that, well, most American presidents would give, other than probably Donald Trump. Although I think people do overstate how hostile Trump was to NATO, too. But uh, no, he talked about American leadership, and we need to be here. Our presence is necessary in Europe now and forever, and we are the defenders of freedom and democracy today, just as we were in 1944. A feared dictator had conquered a continent, had finally met his match. Because of them, the war turned. They stood against Hitler's aggression. Does anyone doubt, does anyone doubt that they would want America to stand up against Putin's aggression here in Europe today? I still think, though, that Biden has been a, a Bob Gates said some time ago that, that Biden had been wrong on every foreign policy issue for 40 years. I think he said that 10 years ago. So we have another decade to add to it. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, certainly Biden has been a better friend to Israel and to Ukraine and to Taiwan than perhaps some might have feared. But he has not been a steadfast or reliable one. Uh, and in particular in the in the Gaza conflict. So you don't think uh, he's been reliable for Israel because he's what? Often no, a few, he hasn't. A few very mild public criticisms of what's going on there. 35, I mean, 40,000 Palestinians dead. But go ahead. He's put a fair amount of pressure, though, on, on Netanyahu to, you know, slow down going into Rafah. You know, his administration has endorsed some of the Hamas propaganda about casualty figures and that sort of thing. I think there's been a lot of different ways. And even in the Ukraine conflict, I think, I think Biden has sort of signaled in generally in the right direction. But there's been a lot of ways in which either they, they've slow walked aid, they... Uh, well, that was Congress know. that slowed down some of the aid as well. No, no. I mean, I, I, they haven't always provided the right, you know, the right things at the right times either. So, I mean, I think there's a lot there's a lot to dislike in Biden's foreign policy. And, but the fact is that we do see both parties. There's a, a growing disenchantment with American leadership abroad. And I think yeah. that is that is a bad thing. Well, I'm not a defender of Biden's foreign policy, but one last remark about the Israel-Gaza thing, and I'll let you respond. In 1982, Ronald Reagan pressured Israel to cut it out when it was destroying Beirut, killing thousands of people. Different set of circumstances and contexts. But the Israelis misled public opinion. They drove all the way to Beirut in 82 to try to install a friendly Maronite Christian government. And they also wanted to get rid of the PLO, of course, in southern Lebanon as well. But Reagan correctly understood that what Israel was doing there was not in U.S. national interests, and he pressured Menachem Begin to quit it. 
the departure of all foreign forces at the request of the Lebanese authorities has been widely endorsed by Arab as well as other states. Israel and Syria have both indicated that they have no territorial ambitions in Lebanon and are prepared to withdraw. It is now urgent that specific arrangements for withdrawal of all foreign forces be agreed upon. This must happen very soon. It is not in U.S. national interests to see what is happening in Gaza right now, and it's not in Israel's interest to lay waste to the Gaza Strip either. Yeah, I, I would disagree with that. I think it is both in our interest and in their interest to see Hamas eradicated. Um, I don't know if that's I mean, possible, and, and look, though. I think, I think I will just say about Reagan that everything Reagan did was animated first and foremost by the Cold War conflict. I think you could look around the world at a lot of things Reagan did that maybe were not the best things for the policy of that particular place at that particular time, but that made a lot more sense within the clarifying framework of the Cold War. I think that's one reason why Reagan struggled with the Middle East, because it didn't fit neatly into the Cold War context. You mentioned before the importance of the executive and why it's important not to vote, in your view, for someone like Donald Trump to such a powerful post. I'm with you on that. I hoped foolishly that after the Trump years and really after decades of the executive accruing too much power in our country, that President Biden would work to diminish the power of the executive branch. Uh, Are you familiar with the Heritage Foundation's playbook for the next conservative administration, Project 2025 at all? Some of it. It runs nearly 900 pages. Yeah, I have not uh, I've not read the playbook yet. I started and then I saw that, oh, it's 900 pages. I'm going to have to get to this later. But I read articles about it. Some of these articles are written by people who have a hostile view of the Heritage Foundation. But just to give you the gist of it, not only you, Mr. McLaughlin, but our listeners who may not be familiar with this, it is all about installing more power to the executive branch to give the president power over all the bureaucracies, gut the federal workforce, and populate it with whom Sean Wilentz on my show referred to as Trump's flunkies. This is a terrible blueprint for the country. I don't know if you have a view on that. I would disagree with some of that. I mean, look, I think the problem with Trump installing hacks and flunkies is that they're Trump hacks and Trump flunkies. You know, I think if you have a good president who is installing loyalists, in a lot more of the executive bureaucracy, that's a good thing because the executive branch, like I I think the executive branch has stolen too many of the powers of the legislative branch. It has exerted too much power outside of itself, but the president should have nearly absolute power within the executive branch. But don't we want a professional workforce? You want at the ground level, a professional, you know, professionals to carry out decisions. You know, and perhaps some to advise the president. But fundamentally, any sort of policy decision should be made by people who are answerable to the electorate. And I think that we have way too much power in the executive branch that is vested in people who are not in any way answerable to the electorate. That is very bad. And so that, I think, is as much as anything what Heritage uh, and others are trying to push back against is the idea of a permanent government that is immune to elections. Proponents of this Project 2025 believe in something called the unitary executive. Is there such a thing as a unitary executive? I would say no, but no one comes to me for legal analysis. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the Bible of the unitary executive theory, if you will, I mean, some of it goes back to obviously much older materials, but is is Justice Scalia's dissent in Morrison versus Olson, in which he talked about the crucial importance of separation of powers and that that could not exist. You know, he quoted the uh, the beginning of the, the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution drafted by John Adams, that the executive shall essentially that each of the branches shall exercise its powers and no other to the end that we should be a government of laws and not of men. And that's that's the essence of the unitary executive is the idea that the executive exercises all the executive power and none of the judicial power and none of the legislative power. And so I think it is absolutely consistent with the the framers' intentions. Now, the framers thought we would have a much smaller executive branch. There was no Justice Department. Uh, 250 years of history and things like the Civil War and then World War II and the programs that were put in place uh, during the Great Depression, etc. I mean, we have a large administrative state for good reason. We are a large and powerful and populated country. I guess I'm puzzled as to why you think it's a good idea to 
impart more power to the executive branch when I think right now is a time where it needs less power. I think it's become too powerful. Well, the Civil War was fought and won by a government in which the entire executive branch was totally controlled by the president. Actually, ironically, it's the if you want to find the intellectual roots in America of a bureaucratic state that was more resistant to presidential control, uh, it's actually in the Confederate government. The Confederate Constitution was designed to put more restrictions on the president's ability to remove executive officers without legislative consent. It was designed to potentially give the the members of executive department seats in the legislature. So it was actually the roots of the administrative state are actually much more easily found in the in the Confederate government, which, of course, did not function terribly yeah. well, despite developing a, a gigantic bureaucracy. What do you think of the left liberals such as Samuel Moyne, Daniel Bessner? These are professional scholars, historians who say we have mainstream liberalism to blame for Trump. I don't know that it's mainstream liberalism per se. I actually think one of the largest contributors to a lot of our current ills and things that ended up pushing us to to Trumpism is the arrogation of a huge amount of power in the judiciary and the use of that to produce wrenching social changes at the national level. And obviously the one that kind of immediately preceded the rise of Trump was the Obergefell same-sex marriage decision, which was immediately followed by two things, one of which was a rapid shift to, you know, focus on transgenderism issues, and the other, which which obviously carried with it the same air that, well, we're going to carry this through the courts no matter what the voters think. And the other, of course, was the sudden arrival, if you will, of you know, the Ferguson riots, the sort of reparations movement and the predecessors to what we would see later in the critical race theory and DEI and all of that. I, I think there was a whole stew of that stuff coming up in the last few years of Obama, but which had roots in the seizure of a lot of power, cultural power by the courts. And so necessarily, what does that do? It does a bunch of things. It polarizes everything at the national level. It gives people a sense that the elites are in control and not listening to the people. It draws up everything into a binary choice where the executive is merely a tool for the appointment of judges who, who are the people who really control the country. And all of that, I think, contributed, you know, and, and frankly, you know, a sense that the other piece of that is that, you know, we had these judicial wars going on for half a century in which Republicans kept voting for what they thought they were going to get. And then instead they get a long series of moderate to liberal Supreme Court justices who didn't do the things that the people thought they were voting for. So I think the courts were an enormous, enormous contributor to this and the combination of that with you know, left-wing social movements. I look at other factors on the road to Trumpism. First of all, he just didn't, as you said earlier, uh, he just didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, His antecedents were the post-Cold War shift in the Republican Party to more populist, maybe economic nationalist strains of thinking. There's a lot of leftover and reasonable, or I should say uh, justifiable anger at things like NAFTA, free trade, which Buchanan and Ross Perot uh, railed against. We had two forever wars, which were disastrous. We had the uh, subprime mortgage meltdown in 08. Uh, Of course, immigration is a big issue as well. So I look at other factors on the road to Trumpism, but maybe what what is perplexing to people is the speed with which Trump was embraced by so many people when he spoke and acted in ways that a lot of us didn't think could be acceptable or get away with. So his politics weren't new, but he was new. And I guess that's why he just seemed to come out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, look, I don't disagree that there's a lot of different roots here and and certainly general discontent with the credit crisis, with the Iraq war, with neoliberal economics, if you will. The other thing I I think that we, we can't forget is that our political system was to a large extent deranged by the 2012 election, which seemed like a sort of status quo election at the time, right? The president had won a majority of the vote in getting elected in 2008. He wins a majority and gets holds on to most of the same states and gets reelected in 2012. But an awful lot that happened in that election that really drove the system nuts. On the Democratic side, I think a lot of what happened, and partly this is a misreading even of the exit polls, was that Mitt Romney won decisively among just about every group that was considered to be swing voters. You know, he won like white suburbanites and white women and Catholics and all these other groups. 
and then Obama was able to defeat him by moving the center of the electorate by turnout among young voters, non-white voters, but basically what, what are seen as the progressive base. And I think, unfortunately for the Democrats and the country, that too many Democrats concluded from that that they could just avoid worrying anymore about the white working class or about, you yeah. know, sort of the center of the electorate. That's the largest constituency in the country. But yeah, go on. Yeah. And, and Obama did much better among those voters than people realized at the time, at least among white working class voters in the Midwest. That's why he was able to carry places like Ohio and Iowa that collapsed on the Democrats four years later. But, you know, on the Republican side, I think there was there was a very deep sense that, look, we tried the most clean cut, respectable, polite, deferential ticket we could possibly find in Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. And they got lied about. They got slimed. They got, you know, Joe Biden yelled over. Ryan, every time he tried to talk at the debate, like Romney got trampled by the debate moderator, like there was a real sense that, OK, you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Like we, we tried it your way for too many times. It's not working. And Trump is the only guy with the, the sheer chutzpah to just go there and do anything to win. I think there was a fair amount of the Republican base that just took that argument to heart and said, you know what, no more Romney, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And that's why those people, some of those people saw Trump, some of Trump's vices as a plus, because they're like, this guy is not, you know, he's not going to stop at anything. to win. Yeah, I mean, they're in awe over it. How can anyone stand up there and just say these things? This guy has got to have guts to be able to do that. That's the, the attitude anyway. A couple more things. I promised I wouldn't keep you for too long. So a couple more things. I mean, not all is lost for conservatives. You do have the Supreme Court. But I'll ask you about two things in particular. Uh, Sean Wilentz, the great historian, has uh, influenced my thinking on these issues with some of his recent essays in the New York Review of Books. Uh, the reasoning of the conservative majority, minus Barrett, in the uh, Colorado ballot case, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, uh, this was not originalism. This was an invention of something where they uh, said Congress has to pass a law to bar a candidate who is seeking national office a candidate who has participated in an insurrection. That's the opposite of what Section 3 says. Congress has to lift an automatic sanction that automatically disqualifies an insurrectionist, not pass an additional law to bar them. What do you think? Yeah, I think the court got the right result in Anderson, but I think its reasoning was very wrong. I really believe that they should have done the one thing they really did not want to do, which was engage with the merits. Because what they should have found is that Trump did not engage in insurrection. The, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, talks specifically about engaging. It's an active verb. The Congress in the late 1860s in a series of exclusion cases ruled, you know, simply giving speeches and writing articles and things that helped incite secession – doesn't count as engaging in the insurrection. You had to be active, an active participant. Planning, and, planning you know, involves it counts there too, though. I mean, yeah, it, it would have to be, but it would have to be planning of a, a concrete sense, not yeah. just encouraging people verbally. So I, I don't think that they had, they ever had any kind of anything that would put Trump in the same category as the people that Congress actually excluded. And, and I think that those cases, even though those cases were decided by Congress rather than the court. I think those cases show pretty clearly that Trump should not have been excluded. There was a slightly better, I think, procedural argument, maybe that because it's the presidency that the decision to exclude should have been exclusive to Congress and counting the electoral votes, I suppose. I'm not sure I buy that, but it was a little it would have been a little more persuasive than what the court actually did. Well, Mark Graber, University of Maryland law professor, has done the work on this. He went back to like the 14th century and studied every insurrection case. And in his view, Trump's behavior fits the definition of insurrectionist. But, you know, there was no consensus on this. This was not 1860 where everyone knew that if you fought for the Confederacy, you were an insurrectionist. So we'll move on to my final thing, Dan. Thanks for hanging in here. Trump's claim of absolute immunity historians of the founding era submitted an amicus or amicus brief saying that this is nonsense. There's nothing in the Constitution or in our history, our historical experience that supports the idea that a president has, or a former president, absolute immunity from criminal prosecution. What do you think? Strictly as an originalist matter, I think the problem is, you know, the record is pretty vague on this. And it's vague in part because the presidency was a new office. And although the presidency was in some ways modeled on the crown, it was simply not, for this particular purpose, it was not comparable to the king, right? Because a king, by definition, couldn't violate the law because all laws 
emanated from the king's name. So the presidency was always going to be different than a king in that sense. I think the problem is that we are thickly laid with precedents on a variety of official immunities. The Constitution provides only one of them explicitly, right? The legislative immunity. And yet we have presidential immunity from civil lawsuits. We have judicial immunity. We have a variety of qualified immunities for all manner of executive officers from cops up the chain. You know, I think it would be healthy for the court to use this case to begin reorienting the entire vast body of immunity law more towards the original understanding. But I'm not sure that they're going to do that. And I'm not sure that uh, I'm not so convinced that, that the original understanding has no room for any official immunities. I did think that the government did just an absolutely horrendous job in, in, in the argument of that case, though. It seemed like even the, the lawyer who argued the case for the government was just trying to poke the stick in the eye of the conservative justices instead of attempting to persuade them, because he built his whole argument around the idea that the Justice Department can be trusted not to politicize cases, and therefore there's no need for immunity, which is just nuts. Uh, that's just not how you persuade this court of anything. I think he needed to wrap himself much more directly in the originalist sources if he wanted to get an originalist ruling. Well, I'm an originalist in so far, and what I'm about to say guarantees I'll never work for the National Review. That's all right. I enjoy reading the National Review. I don't have to work for it. I'm an originalist in so far, as Mark Raber said, it's best where it's needed least. Every state gets two senators. There you go. That's my brand of originalism. I'm trying to be funny, Dan. <laughs> I mean, look, I think this is a tough case because it's the court knows it's writing for the ages. Yeah. And, and yet at the same time, there is a real question of how do you how do you deal with a situation where you have a ton of precedent and the Justice Department is not asking you to overturn any of it? That's the part where I think the court starts to smell a rat, that they're trying to write one set of rules for the president that is not going to be applied to presidential civil immunity or to any other official immunity. The bad lawyering makes bad law. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to stay with U.S. politics in this election year. President Biden's executive order on asylum seekers crossing the southern border. We'll speak to journalist Jonathan Blitzer about the history of our broken asylum system and his book, Everyone Who Is Gone Is Here. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. Have you heard about the 2018 study that showed half of prenatal vitamins tested had unacceptable levels of heavy metals? No? Well, now you have. I'm Kat, mother of three and founder of Ritual, a company making traceability the new standard in the supplement industry. I remember staring at my prenatal vitamins and finding all these things I was trying to avoid. High amounts of heavy metals, synthetic colorants, and unnecessary ingredients. So, at four months pregnant, I quit my job and started Ritual, because I believe that all women deserve to know what they're putting in their bodies and why. I'm so proud of our prenatal vitamin. The ingredients are 100% traceable, it's third-party tested for microbes and heavy metals, and recently received the Purity Award from the Clean Label Project. You see, we trace like a mother because, let's be honest, no one cares quite like a mother. But don't just take my word for it. Trace for yourself with 25% off at ritual.com slash prenatal.